So let me introduce you to Chester. I'm, I'm sure as soon as you hear him speaking, you will be inspired, uh, uh, motivated because he's amazing. I, I really love Chester. He's, he's an expert on, on motivation, on, on work engagement. Um, I love uh, what he has on his website. I love the mission. There's very few people with a mission. So let me read the mission because that's what strike me from Chester. For the better part of two decades, decades, I've devoted my life's work to helping create workplaces where employees feel engaged, enabled, and energized. And know that what they do matters and makes a difference. So who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to work in a place that we love and enjoy and we appreciate it? So I'm really, really excited to have uh, Chester with us and uh, I know you're making time from a very busy schedule, so we look forward to this session with you. Chester, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. I'm a big fan of Antonio's as well. We met through the MG100 group, and it's always great to, to you know, be with people from around the world that are trying to make a difference. And Antonio tells me that's exactly what, what you all do. And so I'm delighted to be here and share with you a little bit about the latest book that we published our research in a book called Leading with Gratitude. And it's, um, it's been a really fun publication. I have a writing partner, Adrian, and we've been writing together for, for 20 years. In fact, this is our 13th book. We've had uh, five New York Times bestsellers, seven Wall Street Journal bestsellers, and our books are in 30 languages. It's really been a fun run. And the reason I, I, you know, you're not supposed to have a favorite child, and yet you do, right? You just won't admit it. <laughs> my, my favorite book is Leading with Gratitude. Because as we studied all these different cultures and all these different leaders and, and different teams, the one thing they all had in common is that they had cultures of gratitude, that they really did appreciate each other. They appreciated their customers, their community, and there was this emotional connection to work, that they believed what they did mattered, that they made a difference. And when they made a difference, somebody noticed that and, and simply said thank you in a lot of different ways. And so it's been, the, it's been a remarkable work. And, and to be able to see that progression, you know, through leadership and teams and culture. And as Antonio knows, in, in our MG100 group, we used a lot of those leaders as case studies. And um, so I thought it'd be kind of fun. We've got a nice group here. And let's put this chat box. I've got a challenge for you. Here's your skill testing question. Because one of the leaders that we studied that is beyond remarkable is a guy named Gary Ridge. Antonio knows Gary well. So Gary, or Gary G-A-R-R-Y, it's the English spelling. He's the CEO of WD-40. How many of you raise your hands have a, a can of WD-40 somewhere in your house? Yeah. We always laugh that um, if you have duct tape and WD-40, you can solve 90% of the world's problems, right? If it moves and it shouldn't, you put duct tape on it, right? If it, if it doesn't move and it should, it's, it's WD-40. Well, here's your skill testing question. What does WD-40 stand for? Do you know? What is the WD and the 40? Put it in the chat box. See if you know. Antonio knows. No, no, no I don't know. No. no. I'm going to try. Let's let's see. We've got so far we have no guesses. <laughs> Andre, what do you think WD40 stands for? Unmute yourself. No idea. Yeah, WD40 and duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, WD40 stands for water displacement 40th formula. Water something. There we go. Rosina got it. Water displacement, 40th formula. Now, the reason that's so interesting is Gary has uh, created this remarkable tribe. This, by the way, is a great little book. It's not, it's not very, it's an easy read. You can read it in, in an hour about a tribal culture. So he's created this tribal culture at, at WD-40. And he says, we don't make mistakes. We have learning moments. And he says, it's baked into the name. You know, it took... 39, you know, trials, 39 learning moments to get to the 40th formula. Well, he loves to talk about his culture as a tribe because he says, you know, 
a team is a little temporary, you know, coworkers, associates, doesn't really get to it. In a tribe, you defend each other, you, you hunt together, right? And, and you celebrate together. So he says, if you've got the right culture, when people make mistakes, you learn from those, right? Those learning moments and you move on. So it's innovation is easy. You don't, you don't hide your mistakes. You're not worried about being blamed or being, you know, punished for making a mistake. And I, you know, to me, that's the essence of a culture of gratitude. You know, we appreciate the effort, didn't go as we planned. Let's learn from that and move on. Now, what's really interesting is in our database, we have over a million engagement surveys, you know, in the employee, employee engagement, like, you know, do you trust your, your immediate supervisor? Will you hear a you from now on? Feeling appreciated at work is almost always near the bottom. And engagement, if, if you're over 30%, it's actually not bad. That's a little above average. At WD-40, they have a 99% engagement score, which is unheard of. They also have 99% of the employees at WD-40 say they're proud to tell their neighbors and friends that they work at WD-40. So pride in the work, pride in the brand, tribal culture, innovation and a safe place. We, we actually kicked off the, um, the book with a story about Gary in the last recession, right? 2008, 2009 in there. He, uh, he was visiting his various locations and he tells the story, he says, people kept coming up to me and saying, hey, Gary, are you okay? And he'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So no, really, are you okay? And it kept happening. So he goes back to the hotel and he calls his wife and he says, honey, do I look sick? Like, do I give off an unwell vibe? Mm. And she said, Gary, they're not asking, are you okay? They're asking, is the company okay? And that's when he uses this quote that I love. He said, and that's when I realized we shouldn't waste a good crisis. That everywhere our employees are hearing from their friends, the horror, right? Layoffs, companies going out of business. When they come to WD-40, they're going to hear about the good news. That we're going to invest in them. That we're going to invest in research. And when 2000, 2010 came and the recession was, was ending, they increased their market cap by 300%. Under, under Gary's leadership, they've gone from a $280 million company to a $2.8 billion company. And he, how did he do it? Tribal culture, learning moments. We care about each other. And when we care about each other, we care about our customers, we care about our, our communities. Remarkable story. Well, that's a little bit about our work and the power of gratitude. So, Antonio, Chester, that's us. I want to um, know a bit more about you before. I have a few questions, of course, about your research. But, Chester, uh, when you were at school or when you were a kid, did you want to be like uh, such a guru or expert on what you are, write so many books? What did you want to do and how did you become what you are? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting you ask. When I was 10 years old, I sat down and I actually wrote the titles to every book we've already written. No, I'm kidding. Nobody does that. Um, I, uh, no, I never, I, I, I never did. I, I grew up in a ridiculously happy household. I have four older brothers. My parents were ridiculously madly in love. You know, they were married for 65 years. And, you know, we, we were a family that was very competitive. We played a lot of tennis. We played a lot of basketball. You know, with five boys, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. There was a lot, of, um, <laughs> a lot of blood spilled in our house. Um, and most of us went into sales. You know, we, we loved that idea of a product and a service that would help people. So the way I got into writing and so on is I, I sold TV time in Detroit and New York. My dad was in radio. You know, he was a radio announcer and then he ran radio stations. It was really fun because you get all kinds of free stuff, right? When, you're, when, you're, when, when your dad runs the TV station. And um, after selling broadcast time for, for a few years, I, I started to sell recognition programs for a company out of Utah. And I did it for 19 years. I loved it. This idea of celebrating employees, whether it was for longevity or achievement or innovation. And I had this idea as I was doing some various projects and I called our CEO, uh, who, we had a great report with Kent, Kent Murdoch. And I said, hey, Kent, nobody's written the definitive book on employee recognition. 
And if we write the book, we'll become the thought leaders, thought leaders publish. And you would make my life a lot easier because as the salespeople, then people call us because we're the, we're the authorities and I wouldn't have to cold call. And he goes, I love the idea of writing a book. He says, well, write it. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not a writer. I'm a sales guy. And I think you misunderstood. I, I was thinking you should write the book and then I should benefit from this book. Right? And he said something that actually was an absolute game changer. He said, you know what, Chester, you're a smart guy. Figure it out. Isn't that great? Nice. So I did. I played with ideas for about a year. And then he called me back and he said, you know what, Chester, I've just hired a new VP of communications. His name is Adrian Gostick. He's a writer. Introduce yourself and write the book. So a year after that, was I'll never forget, it was 2000. We wrote a book called Managing with Carrots. And that's, that's become our theme. You know, more carrots, less stick. This is our little mascot, Garrett the Carrot, right? And that kicked it off. We, we sold 30,000 copies of that book. And then we wrote a book called The 24 Carrot Manager. And then A Carrot a Day. And every book sold a little more. People said, hey, we loved your book. Of course, you speak on your books, right? And we went, yeah, sure. <laughs> That sounds like fun. You know, we had our day jobs, so we didn't have to depend on that. And, and then the, the Keystone book that we wrote that was our, our big bestseller was called uh, The Carrot Principle. And we sold well over half a million copies in 30 languages. And, and then we started to speak literally all over the world. And um, we developed training to go with our, our speaking. And so it's been great fun. You know, we, we worked really hard to hone our writing skills and our speaking skills and and that's kind of our story. Nice. It's a, it's a bit by chance, you know, sometimes most of the people I talk or we talk here are somehow never planned to be what they are. And it's just kind of finding your passion, I guess, or what you are good at in the way. But a question that came when you were talking about Gary is, uh, how big is his company? And I can see making a tribe with 60 people, but or in your projects, but how can you make that the whole company dances the same way or how can you kind of cascade that? What are the things that you've seen that, um, yeah, doesn't create silos? Is everybody the same? Yeah, great question. You know, uh, before we get into that, I will tell you that it is pretty funny when I, when I meet old friends from high school, I, you know, I grew up in Canada and they, they look at me and they go, you're a best-selling author. And I go, well, I have a partner who's the writer. And they go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Huh. <laughs> Because you know, they, they know me, they go, I, I don't remember you being a really good writer. I said, well, I'm not. I, you get that you surround yourself with good people, right? Um, to the point with Gary, yeah, they have a few thousand employees. And of course, they're all over the world. You know, it went from uh, very much a U.S. brand to now a global brand. And that, that really is the role of the leader. And nobody does it better than Gary. You know, he does reach out. He connects with people one-on-one -on -one on on, often. He makes sure he's got the Zoom calls. He was, a tra he was basically a vagabond, you know, traveling the world and making sure he was making those connections. So Gary very much committed to the core principles of WD-40. And their, their number one value is we do the right thing. I mean, just so simple. Oh. And he says, and if you don't get that, none of the other principles make sense, right? If you can't do the right thing, nothing else matters. So he's got a, he's got an, a, a wonderful way of keeping it simple, keeping it memorable, and keeping it top of mind. You know, they talk about learning moments. They, they talk about creating forever memories. You know, he just wrote, by the way, if you're on LinkedIn, uh, Gary Ridge, R-I-D-G-E, he wrote a wonderful article on what I've learned during COVID. It's a little long. Um, I'll tell you though, it's 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 worth the read. And he he talks about this this email that he got from one of his employees that you know with COVID they were sheltering in place. He decided to do some more cycling, right? So he pulls out his bike and he ducks, dusts it off, and he takes his daughter. He said, which was odd. He says, Let, "Let's go get some WD-40." Now I thought it was weird that he was an employee of WD-40 and didn't have any WD-40 at home. At any rate. They go to the hardware store and they buy the can and they come back and he says to his daughter, he says, you know, what do you think we just did? Or what do you think we're doing? And she says, oh, we're just running errands and doing chores. And he said, no, we're creating a forever memory. And she says, what do you mean by that? 
And then he, he did something really remarkable. He took a rag. They wanted to clean the bicycle chain, right, with the WD-40. He sprayed the WD-40 on a rag, and he said, smell this. Now, as you know, it has a very distinctive smell, WD-40. And he said, smell this, and then we're going to clean this bike. And I promise you, every time you smell that smell, you'll remember helping your dad clean his bike. And we're going to create this, this, this memorable moment, you and me, daddy-daughter time, fixing my bike. And, and see, Gary says, look, we're, we're not a lubricant company. We're a company that creates memories and lasting memories and lasting positive memories. And I, if you can do that with a lubricant, you know, with a, a can of, of oil, and he does it brilliantly. And so that's how he keeps his people connected. He keeps that emotion and their mission top of mind because the company is not at all siloed and it is remarkable. So great question. Long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, Chester, and gratitude, can you give us a couple of tips of how can we become better on that? Yes. In fact, I wrote a whole book about that. <laughs> <laughs> So what we did in the book, and it, we staged it out, is we, we tell the story of Gary Ridge, and then we talk about the gratitude gap, which is fascinating. So we came across this study, and I think you'll love this. We asked, you know, leaders, supervisors, managers, we said, do you think you're above average in giving recognition and gratitude? 67% said yes. Oh, I'm really good at this. You know, my people know I love them, and they love me. So then we thought, well, it'd be fun. We'll ask their direct reports. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> and only 23% said yes. So there's this gap. And it's not just about, you know, giving gratitude. It's about seeing and knowing, you know, where the good work has been done, right? So then we, so then the next section, we dispel the myths. Because, you know, leaders will often say, oh, that's a soft skill and a nice to have. It's not a must have. It's a nice to have. Well, I think COVID has really shone the light on the fact that if you don't have your people emotionally engaged, if they don't feel valued, they're not going to be productive, right? And there's no better way to engage people and communicate than simple random acts of kindness and simple expressions of gratitude. So they, they give us this pushback. Oh, it's all about compensation. Get the money right. People will do anything. Well, we know that's not true. That money's not important. Of course it is. It's just, it's very short term or fear. This was really interesting, Antonio. People said, well, fear is the best motivator. We said, yes, short term, it can be. Long term, you exhaust people, you burn them out. And we had a lot of leaders that were leading by fear. They didn't realize they were leading by fear. You know, they would, they would do this passive aggressive stuff. Well, you know, if we don't hit the quotas, I can't guarantee your job. That's not fear. That's just being open and honest. You know, and scaring the crap out of everybody at the same time. Yeah. So then we got into the practices, which, you, which we want to get to. It was seeing and then expressing. So we talk about eight, eight practices to, for extraordinary business results. And we won't go through all of them. But on the seeing side, it's really interesting. My favorite is assume positive intent. Now, isn't that interesting? That when leaders assume positive intent about the people that work with and for them, it changes the atmosphere, it changes the culture. Hubert Jolie, who's, who's in our group, Best Buy, he took him from a billion dollar deficit to a billion dollar surplus. Not bad, right? He said, look, I may be naive. I assume that people come to work wanting to do a good job. And in trying to do a good job, they make mistakes. And that's okay. And that's okay. Because you're trying to do a good job. So this idea of assuming positive intent is such a key component to developing an engaging workplace and where people want to come and, and thrive, right? As opposed to a fearful workplace where you've got to hide, you know, your mistakes. And the other is, is, is to make it peer to peer, mm. that it's not just top down, that you've got mechanisms by, why, by which, you know, your coworkers and your teammates can, can do the shout outs and so on, because as leaders can't possibly see everything. What, what, what's your take on that? Let's throw, I'm, I'm talking too much here. Let's throw, throw it out to the group. Assume positive intent. Does that resonate with you? Is that, or am I up in the night? No, I love that, Chester, because Thomas was in the board of PMI uh, together, and that was something we were using all the time. 
we would, we would have really tough arguments and very different point of view, but it was like the rule, assume positive intent. It's not personal, it's a different point of view, it's diversity, so I'm sure Thomas recognized that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, in COVID, people don't get back to you right away. That's okay, they'll get to you. You know, be a little patient. Yeah. You know, a lot, lot of stuff going on. I want to ask uh, Rosina, you made a comment here, if you want to share it and maybe lead it to observation or a question for Chester. Yeah, just um, I think on that empathetic um, view that also I've been sort of looking at creative leadership as well. And I think indeed when you're talking about gratitude, it's also those soft skills. And sometimes those soft skills are seen as being secondary when actually we've seen how important they are, especially during this period of COVID if we've been talking about female leadership globally, and it's always taken as, oh, they're not so important, they're kind of secondary skills, when actually, I believe they're the strength, is the soft skills, and these are actually strengths that are incredibly strong. Um, and that's what I think for me comes across here, is that that kind of leadership, um, as Chester said, it engages everybody it engages people and you have that sense of empathy and caring and sharing so it was really to say you know what do you think about that narrative of soft as though it doesn't matter right right well first off rosina i lived in brooklyn new york so i love that accent you know that brooklyn accent is really kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting. I always say the soft stuff is the hard stuff, right? The, the, it, and I'll tell you what's what's interesting, Rosina, is a lot of leaders say, well, I would do it more. I just think people will then take advantage of me because I will come across as soft. Now, one of the best examples in the book we had was Alan Mulally. Now, Alan Mulally is the guy that saved the Ford Motor Company in the last recession. And there is no one that's more demanding than Alan Mulally. In fact, he had this, this system where he'd have all his leaders come in every week and they would have all their projects on a spreadsheet. And if you're doing great, it was green. If you were you know, a little behind schedule, it was yellow. And if you were stuck, it was red. And when he took over the Ford Motor Company, he, he said, look, we've got some product problems. We've got a culture problem is our biggest problem. Nobody trusts anybody. Right, it's all eat, eat, you know, kill what you eat or kill or be killed, right? And so he tried to bring in some transparency that people could admit that they were having and ask for help. Now, quick little aside, you'll love this, Rosina. So he comes to take over the Ford Motor Company, and he asks Bill Ford. He says, "How bad is it?" He said, "It's bad." He said, "We're going to lose seventeen billion dollars this year." He goes, "This year." He goes, yeah. So he hired him in the summer. And he said, and you know, by, uh, by the 1st of November, we actually achieved that goal. We actually <laughs> lost $17 billion. So he pulls everybody in and he says, tell me how you're doing. Well, everybody is green in the first meeting. And he goes, well, it's going to take him a while to trust each other. Second week, it was all green. Third week, it was all green. And finally, he said, time out. You realize we just lost $17 billion. Like, how can it possibly be all green? When finally Mark Fields, the North American, you know, head of North American production said, put up a red square and said, I've got a problem in the plant in Windsor, Canada. It's with a door. Here's what's going on. And Alan leans back with a big smile and starts to clap. And he celebrated the fact that someone admitted they needed help. Well, everybody else in the room thought Mark was going to get fired. Instead, what happened is went around the table and within 20 minutes, they'd figured out the problem because it had happened at other factories and solved it. Alan said, you know, it's really interesting. If you think you can't be demanding and, and express gratitude at the same time, you're mistaken. Expressions of gratitude in the hardest times is exactly when you should do it. And if you don't, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Well, a great book was written about Alan called, um, I know you guys are big readers. This is a great book called The American Icon, yeah. How Alan Mulally Saved the Ford Motor Company, written by um, a newspaper guy in Detroit. He said, Alan Mulally, if you, th you know, he's a hail fellow well met. If you meet him, it's all about your people, Chess. You gotta love them up. 
love him up, right? He says, if you think Ellen Mullally is soft, he's got a spine of titanium. So this idea that if you're a gratitude leader, that somehow you're soft and people will take advantage of you, not only is it not true, it's 180 degrees not true. And you think about the leaders that you would do anything for. I guarantee you they were demanding and they cared about you. And they made sure to let you know when you did a good job, it was a good job. Does that, does that make sense to you, Rosina? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's the two, um, as you said, in parallel. Um, and I think more and more we're seeing that, that also showing vulnerability is also a strength. Yep. Which is what came across from your story there. Yeah. And you know what's really interesting, particularly in COVID, people say, what needs to accelerate? And to me, it's really obvious. Communication has to skyrocket and gratitude has to skyrocket. Because in a crisis, you need as much information as you can get. And when you don't, when there's a gap, the void, right, that gap, it gets filled with rumor, innuendo, and fear. <laughs> and none of those are good, right? So you feel, the, even if it's saying, I'm vulnerable, right? Saying, look, I don't know. I'm telling you we don't know, so don't panic. We're going to know soon, <laughs> right? And then the second piece is gratitude, because particularly with COVID, where now you've got a fractured workplace. People are working from home. Some people are still on the assembly line. Some people are, you know, because of their family situation and so on. They're more and more isolated. And the fear is they'll be forgotten. That I want, well, how do, you, how do you express that you still matter and you're remembered? You call them up. You Zoom them up, right? And you say, hey, how are you doing? How can I help? What do you think about this? And those, those are simple acts of gratitude. Boy, I sure appreciate what you're doing from home. I know it's not easy. You got three kids you're trying to homeschool. Your mom is living with you. She's got asthma. You know what I mean? And those connections, communication goes up, gratitude goes up, and people still feel connected. Thank that's you. my story. I'll stick to it. <laughs> nice question, Rosina. I'm moving now to uh, Paula. Where are you calling, Paula? Just... Well, I happen to be in Canada as well, so we're in good company, Chester. <laughs> good job. Where, where in Canada? Um, in London, Ontario. Very nice. I was born in Edmonton, grew up in Vancouver. I, I think we have someone from Alberta as well on our team. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, I'm sure a lot of other people have, have questions, but it was, it's great to uh, see another fellow Canadian making, doing well in the world and with positive principles of gratitude in particular. Um, so part of what you answered with Rosina, it sounds like you answered part of my question in terms of um, how, how do you manifest that in the, in the workplace, gratitude. Um, but specifically, I'm interested in the fact that you had, um, you had um, mentioned an anecdote from Gary Ridge about this sensory experience with the WD-40. And so I'm wondering, based on your own you know, family, happy family childhood, you know. Um, you know, you spoke of your happy family childhood and family interactions. Is there a sensory experience from your very happy or early life which helped resurface that care principle of uh, gratitude, um, which you detail in your writing? Is there an anecdote from your own life that, you know, was a, was a sensory experience that reminded you of this gratitude principle that you know, is a thread, continuous thread through her writing. Absolutely. You know, my, my father, John Dahl, was just the happiest guy you'd ever meet. Mm -hmm. You know, never had a bad word to say about anybody. And you love to be around him because he always made you feel better about yourself. You know, you know how you gravitate to those people? We, we say gratitude. Yep. Back to gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll never forget, I was about 12 or 13 years old and living in Vancouver. And we, we're a big tennis family. We play a lot of tennis. So my dad and I, we used to, Saturday mornings, we'd go play tennis at the Vancouver Lawn Tennis and Badminton Club. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> All whites. And, and we play tennis and then go to McDonald's, get a muffin. Mm -hmm. And then he loved to go to Army and Navy. Now, this is a, a, like a discount big story. It's in Gastown. Just mm -hmm. closed because it closed for 107 years, I think. Mm -hmm. Because my dad loved the bargain. Right. Well, it's in, it's in a bit of a sketchy area. If you've been to Vancouver Gastown, parts of are still pretty sketchy. 
so we anyway we played tennis had our McMuffin, and we were heading to army and navy and we had to go by pigeon park which mm -hmm. is where the homeless people live mm -hmm. and as we were at the crosswalk getting ready to cross the street a homeless lady came across the crosswalk with everything she owned in a brown paper sack and it was funny i remember that it was safeway you know it's weird what you remember right it was a safeway bag mm -hmm. and when she got to the corner it split open and spilled on the mm -hmm. sidewalk now it was nothing you and i'd want to own it was everything she owned, right? And, you know, Vancouver is very much a walking town. And so, you know, everybody kind of gave her a wide berth and just kept moving, right? That's what you do. It's kind of an embarrassing situation, right? And that's what everybody did except for my dad. Mm -hmm. He stopped immediately and he went up and he gathered up her stuff. He said something made her laugh and he got her safely in the park. So here's where the sensory experience comes in because it was smelly stuff, right? He comes back to me and I said, you know, dad, you probably shouldn't touch those people. They're not clean. Because hmm. he actually took her by the arm and escorted her in, the gentleman that he is, right? And he looked at me and he said something I never forgot. Hmm. He said, Chess, you be good to everybody. Everybody's having a tough day. And I never forgot that. You know, hmm. it, it's interesting, whether you're parking cars or bagging groceries or you're driving a Bentley, everybody's got something. And so I, I really encourage leaders, I go, look, when people show up to work with and for you, you don't know what they just came from, right? You don't know if they're having problems with a child, if the money or the virus or whatever. What you do know is that the time they spend with you can be the best part of their day, that they can believe what they did mattered, that they made a difference. And when they made a difference, you noticed it and celebrated it. And you talk about the sensory experience. I've, I've never forgotten that moment that no matter who it is, you be kind because there's something going on in every case, right? So thanks because that's one of my favorite stories about my dad. Well, it's always useful to you know where the origins of, you know, the thought leadership that, uh, that people or guests here propose. And uh, it's, uh, it, it just brings forth the, the, you know, internal drive and the motivation that, that brings you to, you know, talk about gratitude as a force for good business practices um, in the workplace and in the world at large. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, I have a second part to my question though. So as far as the workplace, apart from asking people how their day is and, you know, talking about work, are there any other specific practices that you suggest or promote in terms of embodying gratitude and that carrot principle of you know encouraging people with um, you know not punitive measures but the contrary with with um, stimulus or encouragement are there is there something in particular that you think is key to you know in a in a nutshell that would summarize apart from the word gratitude of course and empathy but a specific practice that you always propose that if you're not going to do anything else do this right another great question. Um, yeah, I think it's really important because we do a lot of executive coaching as well. And I always make it very clear to the leaders that the way they act gives everybody else permission to act the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a jerk, you will produce jerks, right? Because people, if they want to be a leader, they go, well, she's a jerk. He's a jerk. I guess if you want to be a manager, you have to be a jerk, right? And of course, the opposite is true. One of the best practices that, that I encourage leaders to do, and it's really old school and yet incredibly impactful, I tell them, get in the habit of writing handwritten notes and sending them to your people. Hmm. And it's really interesting because, you know, your mail right now is really uninteresting. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's bills or catalogs or, or whatever. And when a card shows up that's not that, it's a different conversation. You know, it's uninterrupted, it's thoughtful, it's, it's the work of the hand. Like you literally took time to put pen to paper. And I get that it's old school. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, you shouldn't call, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's something different though, and more personal about a handwritten note. As an example, this showed up in the mail for me just the other day, literally two days ago. It's from my friend, Randy Haynes. He lives down in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was just out of the blue. Hey, I'm writing to say hello and hope that you and your family are in, in a good spot and in good health. It's been too long since we talked. 
I just wanted to let you know how much I treasure our friendship, how much it's meant to me over the years. We need to get together soon. Never forget how much I love you and that I'm always cheering for you. Wow. How does that not make your day? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and then I high teched him back. I, I, I took a picture of it and said, made my day. Thank you so much. He said, super, let's get put a date on the calendar. Right. So, you know, I tell leaders, here, Look, you write three notes a week for three weeks and you get back to me. Because people will say, I can't believe you took the time. to," And it takes you what? Five minutes tops. Mm -hmm. And that's if you're moving your lips while you're writing, you know. <laughs> um, it's a simple best practice that lets people know you care about them. It's the personal touch. And I find as huge impact. Well, it's a really great way of embodying that gratitude principle as well, because you're physically moving your hand while you're while you're thinking of what you want to say to that person. I like the digitization of it afterwards, because then you keep it for posterity. Um, you might lose the note, but you won't lose the memory. So that's, yep. uh, that's a really great practice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. As we say in Canada, it's kind of like keep your head up and your stick on the ice. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> if I were a hockey player, I would agree with you, but I'm sure another metaphor also applies. Thanks so much, uh, Chester. Oh, Appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you, Paula. One quick question while I move you afterwards to Mike. And Dan, I don't know if you put there a comment or a question, but I see Mike has a question. But uh, Chester, what you're talking is so obvious. And anybody with a kind of big brain or normal brain would say, yes, this is the way. But how come they're still the opposite and they reach to the top? That's what makes me sad or confused or why? Why is that? Yes, it, it, it is so obvious, right? I and mean, we, we say it's common sense. Unfortunately, it's uncommonly practiced. Yeah. And I think what happens is we, we, we just get caught up in all the stuff that we've got to do. And we're checking the boxes and, and we, we, we just, you know, we think we're going to remember to do it later and it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. You know, the, the, it's, it's a discipline, you know, like anything else. I say, look, you have to be intentional and you have to be disciplined. Intentional in that you're going to do it, right? And, and, and that the message is going to be right. And disciplined that you will do it often. Because another one of the myths that, that popped up and we dispelled it in the book is, well, people, uh, you know, get too much recognition. They, you know, it's too much. Younger generations, they want everything to be celebrated. They go, really? Too much recognition in the workplace. That, that's your, you're going to stake your claim on that one. He goes, yeah. I said, great. Let me ask you something. When was the last time anybody that worked for you or you went home at the end of the day and said to your family, your spouse, your partner, couldn't get anything done today? Too much recognition? <laughs> it was a it was a party it was a cake it was a plaque seriously i'm working from home because those people it's just a party all day like no like nobody says that in italy right nobody um and 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 gallup actually did a study get this uh antonio they said that in a given day the number of positive interactions starts to lose its impact after 12 so that 13th moment of praise and recognition, it starts to tail off a little bit. Well, I challenge you to find a day where you had 12 separate incidents where your boss or manager or coworker said, Chester, man, you're just killing it. <laughs> it doesn't. So this idea that, you know, you can do it too much, it loses its meaning. And, and we do say, by the way, general praise has no impact. You know, if you're just running around going, hey, great job, great job, you know, finger guns, hey, you're the best, you're the best. That, that you know, that, that gets annoying very quickly. If you're specific, if you've personalized it, if it's meaningful, it never gets old. It's, it's, it's like hearing of you. You know, can you hear I love you too much? No. I've been happily for 37 years. Trust me, I can't hear I love you too much. So what you're saying, Chester, it works at home too. Yes. And actually, the last part of our book is how do you live a grateful life? Because you know what's really cool, Antonio? Whether it was Gary Ridge or Ken Chenault, who was the retired CEO of IMX, or Indira Noe, you know, she retired from CEO of Pepsi. They all used it at work and they all used it at home. And that was really affirming. You know, they didn't leave their best self at work. They took it home. And so we have what we call the Baker's Dozen 
of things you can do at home to express gratitude. And, nice. and one was really simple. It was, you know, don't be exhausted when you come, when you see your family, be excited to see them. Hmm. Like so often, oh, give me a minute. Oh, you got a deacon breath. It's been a tough day. Come on. These are the people that mean the most to you of anybody. So you see your kid, you see, I'd be excited to see them. It's so Simple, true. right? Yeah. Let me go to Mike Gorham. Where are you calling Mike? And just come up on screen. Yeah, I'm uh, in Bristol in the UK. Um, so, yeah, I was uh, just reflecting on what you were saying earlier about positive intent, Jester, and thinking that in, in my experience, I see a lot of positive intent um, almost everywhere. Um, however, as a leader, I'm often in a situation where I'm seeing positive intent, but I'm not seeing very good execution. Um, um, you maybe made a couple of comments on the relevant term, but I just wondered how would you advise dealing with that kind of a situation? Excellent question. Because sometimes, you know, it gets confused that everybody is doing a great job all the time, no matter what the results are. And of course, that's not true either, right? You have to have the execution. So I think, you you know, you assume positive intent and say, look, great effort. Let's get to the heart of this. How can we, how can we improve quality? How can we make sure that these mistakes aren't being made again? Now, if it keeps occurring and reoccurring and reoccurring, well, then it's a situation where you've got the wrong person in the wrong job. Right. So just because you're leading with gratitude doesn't mean that you never have tough conversations. In fact, the leaders that lead with gratitude, I think it makes the tough conversation easier because you're not always there to beat people up. You give credit where credit is due. Then when you have to have the tough conversation, say, listen, Mike, nobody's more enthusiastic than you are. I really appreciate the positive intent. The fact is we're, we're just not getting the results we need. So let's figure out how to get to those results. Now, if we can't get there, it's okay. We'll, we'll find something else for you to do. Or we'll let you join another team in another country. <laughs> kind of thing. You know, it, it, the fact is, is that there's no substitute for enthusiasm. If the enthusiasm doesn't get you to the results you want, you have to have those conversations. And hopefully, because you've been the leader that's led with gratitude, those sincere and empathetic conversations and conversations are going to be better received and either the results will get better or you have to make a change and it's apparent that there's not a good fit Is that helpful yeah very much so thank you good. thank you thank you mike let's go to brazil andre what's your question uh i'd like to to know if you with the change in remote uh, office, for example, what is regarding facilitating new connections, mentoring, motivation, shadowing, and create a sense of purpose. How are you going to do this remotely? How are you going to do this uh, in a virtual environment? Yeah, I, I, excellent question. Of course, we get that a lot nowadays, right? And again, it comes back to being intentional and disciplined make sure that you're touching base on a regular basis with your people. You know, whether it's a text or it's a group email or it's a group Zoom. And you know, you don't always have to talk about business. And I know time is at a premium. I will tell you though, that the leaders that connect with their people and ask, hey, how are you doing today? You know, because the world is just ever changing, right? Yesterday, you maybe had a good day, today, not so much, right? We've got a spike, we're gonna, we're gonna shut down again or, have you heard about the comet? It's coming, right? I mean, there's just one, you know, disaster after another. And so particularly when people are remote, that one-on-one -on -one connection and creating some group opportunities where you can get together and, and problem solve together. I think one of, the, one of the most important questions in the COVID era, particularly when you're remote, is what do you think? Hey, we're dealing, what do you think? I'd like your opinion on this, Andre. And then as much as you can in, introduce a little fun. You know, one leader, she was great. Um, Friday, she sent pizzas to everybody in her team, just a random pizza night. The other thing she did that I thought was hilarious, by the way, is she said, Friday afternoon, voluntary, you don't have to come. It's a wine and wine session. 
So I said, bring, bring, bring your favorite wine and we can complain about anything. You know, and it's just free for all. It could be your, the teachers. It could be, you know, the city. It could be people that don't wear masks, whatever it is. And she said it was so popular that they actually had hangover Saturday morning. They'd get together. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, on the serious side, make sure you're disciplined and, and you're intentional about making the connections and, and keeping that esprit de corps. And then, you know, have some fun. People need a break. They just do. And whether it's wine and wine or a pizza that shows up or, you know, make, make it fun. And, and those are some of the best practices I've seen. I, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Very, I've never heard that Chester. So it's, I, I love, yeah, these new ideas, the wine and wine. I, I, I think I will, we can do that in this group one day, I think. Yeah. You know, <laughs> beer and bitch. I mean, if you don't like wine, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I see Rosina wrote that uh, listening to the message that you received made her day too. You see, you're okay. spreading. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Chester, two, two questions. I, th I want to finish on time. Where Diversity, is there a difference uh, in, in gender or whatever race right. that you see more gratitude than others? Second, how would you convince, I don't want to give a name, but one of these powerful leaders that we have today who disregard gratitude uh, and it's more selfish than anything. So how would you make these people change their mind if you can? Yeah, well, for, first question, you know, is, um, sorry, what was the first question? I was thinking about gender, so many things. Gender and- oh, gender, yeah, is there a difference? Race or culture? Not so, yeah, not so much in gender. In generationally, there was a big difference. Uh, Younger generations wanted much more connection and not so much the praise and recognition as they wanted to know, how are we doing? You know, mm -hmm. they want to be coached up. And sometimes that's misinterpreted as, oh, you want me to celebrate the fact you showed up today? Well, you know, that's a little cynical. What they want to know is, hey, I'm on the, see, they're used to getting a lot of feedback. You know, your kids play video games. You, you know that when you play Mario Brothers, you get 300 positive pings per minute playing that game. Oh. Like 300 a minute. And then they get in the workplace and they say, yeah, when you hit five years, I'm going to give you a pin. They go, yeah, that's, that's not working for me, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, more frequency in younger generations we saw. Uh, older generations, it's, it's interesting. Um, there wasn't so much a gender difference as there was generationally. The older you got, the, the, less, it, the less frequency you needed, you wanted it to be more about legacy, which was interesting. With, with like big leaders, you know, whether it's a big corporation or, or politicians, on the politician side, you know, I'd say vote them out. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, most politicians are fairly old and I don't think they're going to change. And so the, your best bet on that one is, is vote them out. Senior leaders, it's really interesting because I get Steve Jobs and, and Jeff Bezos a lot. They say, hey, those guys are jerks and they've had phenomenal success. And I, and, and I would agree with that. I'll tell you what, though. They're not stupid. And what they've done is they've surrounded themselves with really good people that make up for their deficits. I mean, Steve Jobs, you know, he had some really good people around him that were very empathetic, that, that could take his vision and his demanding nature and translate that. Because, you know, one of the things that you know about Apple is they kept people. People stayed at Apple. Well, they didn't, they didn't stay because Steve Jobs was so warm and friendly. <laughs> they stayed because the work was interesting and their people in their group got it. Same with Bezos. I've got a nephew that works at Amazon. And he says, yeah, Jeff, can, Jeff Bezos is pretty prickly. He says, I'll tell you what, though, the people around him, incredibly empathetic and caring. So they're smart enough to put good people around them to make up for their deficits. Yeah. Nice. That's uh, that's a good. There's one last question from Gerardo. Gerardo, where are you calling from today? I am calling from San Andres Cholula, Puebla. Nice place. Nice. Thank you. Mucho gusto. Uh, mucho gusto, Chester. Chester, so uh, my question is, how do you keep gratitude ongoing to be a continuous regardless of the situation? And I am asking this because uh, I lost my job back in May and the pandemic was like two months here in, in Mexico. So I said, okay, this is nice because I can go back to my home and watch for my family 
So I have gratitude for that instead of saying, oh, I lose my job. Well, I have the opportunity to be uh, close to my family, get more acquainted of what my, my kids are doing, uh, my wife that works at home. So I realized I, I made a lot, a lot of new things from them. So I'm, I have gratitude for that. But now they have passed six months, still haven't found the job I, I am looking for. About two months ago, I, I got a, a job that is paying a fifth of what I was earning before. But I got a job, you know? And, and, and these guys have a project manager that used to be a director, so they are really enjoying it because they are getting a lot of information, a lot of, of, uh, of brain, maybe not a lot of hands, but a lot of brain. <laughs> and and uh, they are learning a lot. I am also learning and I have gratitude for that. And I am earning some money to pay my kids to school. So I have gratitude for all these things that are happening to me, but, but, but money is, is about to, to not to be enough by the end of the year. And I am starting to get a little more stressed, you know? So how do you keep gratitude on going uh, to be a continue regardless of this situation and, and, and please tell me how that helps for things to improve. You know, it, uh, by the way, I think it's wonderful that you've got a job. I hope you, you, you start to make more and you have a, a ridiculously positive attitude and that's going to serve you well. You know, I, I put a, a couple of things in place uh, in our family that, that helps. And like you, by the way, 90% uh, of my revenue was speaking at conferences. <laughs> so you can imagine that 90% of my revenue disappeared overnight. Um, you have to transform, you have to adjust and do those kinds of things. Two things. One is at the end of every day, we get together as a family and we say, what are your three? What are three things you're grateful for? To end the day on a positive note, there's a lot of uh, work that's been done around gratitude journals that people that are in a state of gratitude, uh, you can't be in a state of gratitude and be stressed out at the same time. And they, they are mutually exclusive. And so to end your day in, in, in an, an attitude where you're grateful for the nice weather, the family, your good health and so on, it actually allows you to sleep better. Now on, on that, you know, hoping that things will get better, right? The great thing about gratitude, we talked about it earlier, is gratitude attracts gratitude. You know, you've got a great network. I mean, there's a great network right here. I've got a dear friend named uh, Bob Bodine. He's an executive placement, uh, an executive placement company in Dallas, Texas. He said 80 per, 87, get this, 87% of jobs are filled on the recommendation of a friend. So he said, who's your who? That's his big thing. Who's your who? Who, he says, you've got 12 people that you would trust with your life and your kids. Those 12 people have friends. Your friends' friends are your friends. If you will just ask, they will be happy to help. So work your network. And the fact that you have such a positive attitude and you, you are grateful for what you have, not worrying so much about what you don't have, leverage that with your who and expand through your network. Because the, the odds of, of getting a better job on the recommendation of a friend are exponentially higher than surfing the web and going to Indeed and these rest and the rest. Now, it was really interesting on a lighter note. I said to Bob, I said, why 12? And he said, well, it worked for Jesus, <laughs> right? He had 12 <laughs> apostles. And I said, well, when you think about it, only 11 of the 12 really worked out because that one guy, you know, caused a lot of pain. My point is, is that, you know, work your network, get those 12, get the friends of those 12 and start to leverage that with intense gratitude, because I can just tell from your voice, I mean, you're a guy, your call, people will take your call and then say, hey, here's my situation. Here's what we went through. Here's what I'm looking for. Do you know anybody? And he'll say, you know, I don't, I've got a friend though that works in that industry. Let's call him. Now you've got the introduction. Now you've got another level. And I found it works like, it works so well. You know, you think about the jobs you've gotten, I, I would guarantee you that most of them are referrals from our friend. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you very much, Chesa. Now, Antonio, I know you've only got one minute. I want to finish with the, the last story about my dad, because he was by far my biggest cheerleader. And this was a story told to me by my brother, Byron. And I think we'll end on a really positive note. So in my church, where we grew up a very faithful family, 
we don't have paid ministers. Everybody volunteers. So my dad at the time was the youth minister. So he worked with all the kids in our congregation. And, you know, there's always one woman in the congregation or one old guy that's just miserable and he wants everybody else to be miserable. And we had one. So after church, <laughs> this, this elderly woman came up to my dad and said, you know, Brother Elton, you think all the kids in our congregation just love you. Well, I'm here to tell you they don't. And he said, with a big smile, he says, well, thank you very much. And she says, well, it wasn't meant to be a compliment. And he said, too late. <laughs> so he said, I just assume that everything everybody says to me is a compliment and I'm happy. So on that happy note, uh, assume positive intent, take everything as a compliment. Gratitude attracts gratitude. And when people believe what they do matters and they make a difference, never forget to say thank you. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you Chester. Thank what you, Chester. a memorable session. I think we'll go back. I love it. Thank you. I hope, uh, thank you on behalf of everybody in this group for your time and we'll follow your work for sure. Thank you very much, Chester. Follow us on LinkedIn and buy the book. <laughs> We'll see you guys. Recommend it. Take Thank care. you very much. Everybody, see you guys. See you next week. Yes. Thank you.